Hello and welcome back. We're still continuing to talk about entropy, right? And we've talked about how to calculate entropy change of the surroundings. We've talked a little bit about the fact that entropy is the sole predictor of spontaneity, but we haven't done anything useful yet. And so we're working our way up to how do we know if a reaction is going to happen or not, right? That's the useful predictor. It's still a ways away. It's still a ways away. But how do we know if a reaction is going to happen? What we're going to look at right now is we're going to look at ways of just qualitatively, instead of quantitatively, predicting the sign of delta S. And you remember delta S here, since I don't have a subscript that says system surroundings or anything like that, we are assuming that we're talking about the system. Now, what does the system mean? Well, whenever we have a chemical reaction, and so let's talk about a very simple one we've already talked to, water liquid goes to water gas this chemical reaction is almost always our system we're looking at water liquid turning into water gas and then everything else is our surroundings okay so in our system here how can we predict the sign of delta s well we did it for this one we said hey look in the liquid phase we've got some entropy change things can move or some entropy things can move around a little bit in the gaseous phase we have a very large entropy and so we get that delta s is big s minus little s and we know that's going to be greater than zero so for simple ones like this for melting for evaporating we can predict very well that uh, entropy change is going to increase because the gas state always has a ton of entropy associated with it okay so what about slightly more complex systems so let's go ahead and do a different reaction here let's do nitrogen reacting with three hydrogen molecules to make two ammonia molecules how could we possibly predict the sign of entropy change of this reaction right this reaction is because it's a chemical reaction is generally what we define as our system so how are we going to predict the entropy change of that well remember everything that moves around in the gas phase has a lot of entropy available to it right? it has lots of ways of moving around we've got a bunch of things in the gas phase here now it turns out that we're going to see in a little bit that the complexity of the molecule also contributes to s but not near as much as the fact it's a gas. So right, the complexity does add a little bit of, oh, you can bend, you can do other things like that with my energy, but the fact that it's a gas means it moves around. So what do we have, right? We've got some entropy of the nitrogen, we've got some entropy of hydrogen one, some entropy of hydrogen two, and some entropy of hydrogen three. And then we've got some entropy here for ammonia. Right? And they're all roughly the same because they're all gases at the same temperature, they're part of the same system. And so we can actually look here and be like, well, you know, I've got two units of entropy on the right. I've got four units of entropy on the left. 2s minus 4s is going to be a minus 2s. Entropy itself is always positive. Entropy itself is always positive. S equals k times the natural log of w. W is always 1 or greater. And so entropy is always a positive number. Entropy change, delta s, can absolutely be negative or positive but entropy itself is always a positive number. And so here I've got minus two times some random entropy. I don't know what it is, but it's a positive number. Minus two times a positive number is gonna give me a negative entropy change. So I can say that the entropy change of my system here is less than zero because I decreased the amount of entropy. Now we can do it by writing out little s's like this, but the easier way is to look at the number of moles of gas on each side of your equation. Because gas has the most entropy of all the states, gases will always win. And so here I've got two moles of gas on the right. I've got one plus three equals four moles of gas on the right. And so four moles of gas is going to have more entropy than two moles of gas. And so I decrease my entropy, delta S of the system is less than zero. How about if I take some calcium carbonate and I'm going to decompose that into calcium oxide and CO2. Okay, how do we predict the sign of that entropy change? And again, we're looking at entropy change of the system the system is generally our chemical reaction. Well, we've got three different things here, but I'm gonna tell you this. 
gases have so much more entropy than solids or liquids. If you have any gas around, it just completely shoves out entropy changes from your solids and your liquids. So you really only need to consider the gas. And so I've got gas on the right, I have no gas on the left, so I've got essentially a large entropy over here, relatively small entropy over here, and I'm going to have a entropy change that is greater than zero. You'll notice up here, just for fun, I put the system just for fun. I didn't put it here. Remember, they mean the same thing. A thermodynamic quantity without a subscript is generally considered to be that of the system. So because I have a gas, I'm just going to look at that gas because so much more entropy, so many more ways of arranging a gas than there are of a solid or a liquid that they always win. Okay? So if I, even if I had um, seven different solids on the left and one gas on the right, that gas is going to win. Now, if I had 400 solids, yes, okay, that starts to add up. But you're never going to run across that. You're never going to run across that system. You're always going to be able to look, be like, hey, I've got a gas. That gas is going to dominate my uh, entropy changes. So always, whenever there's gas, you can just look. Oh, I've got three moles of gas on the right, two moles of gas on the left. I had more gas at the end. Gas wins positive entropy change. Or I ended with four moles of gas. I started with five moles of gas. I had less gas negative entropy change. You can always do that with gases even when there's other phases present. All right, just to check in, entropy change of the surroundings in an experiment was determined to be minus 82.3 joules per mole Kelvin. What can we determine about this reaction? Is it endothermic, exothermic, spontaneous, or non-spontaneous? And go! What did you come up with? Well, we know entropy change of the surroundings is minus 82.3 joules per mole Kelvin. We also know the entropy change of the surroundings is minus delta H over T. Uh, that minus there, that comes from that. So that means, must mean my delta H is positive, so I know it is endothermic. Do I know it's spontaneous versus non-spontaneous? Um, I, I don't, right? I know the entropy change of the surroundings was negative, which, you know, a lot of people are like, well, it's non-spontaneous then, right? Remember, the entropy change of us forming our bodies is negative, but it does happen, and so we know that the entropy change of the universe must be going up, okay? So, here, we know the entropy change of the surroundings is negative, but what if the entropy change of the system is this huge positive number? It would still be a spontaneous reaction because the entropy change of the universe would be positive. But we don't know that. We aren't given the information. And so we, the only thing we can determine is that, one, it is endothermic. Random thing that's really cool, but just to think about. It turns out entropy is the only thermodynamic quantity that implies or even requires time. Enthalpy doesn't require time. What do you mean by that? Well, if it was small, it must be larger in the future. What? Well, we said that any spontaneous process must increase the entropy of the universe. And so that implies that the universe had this small entropy, and in the future we'll have this larger entropy, which implies the existence of time. And it also relates to the fact that entropy is always increasing, that you can always tell whether a system is defying those laws or not. If I play a video of sugar dissolving forward, it makes sense to you. If I play a video of sugar dissolving backwards, you're like, that doesn't make any sense. And so you can see the element of time in there. If I play a re, uh, something of a reaction uh, going forward and a reaction going backwards, most of those reactions, if you just looked at the enthalpy, if you could somehow see the enthalpy, you're like, okay, heat goes in, heat goes out, that's fine, right? Because heat is conserved. And so there's no time in conservation. But in something getting larger over time, that one, really implies time. And so people actually call this the arrow of entropic time that says because entropy has to be increasing constantly in the universe, 
but that implies that there is time, that time does exist. Um, there's a great video on YouTube. If you want to look it up, there's a link there, or you can just search for Acapella Science in Tropic Time. And it's a great video. It's a song parody. It's fun to watch. And uh, he does a lot of good things. And in fact, if, if you're a nerdy type, you can get lost on the Acapella Science uh, channel for, for quite some time looking at all his videos. Unfortunately, they're all several years old now, and he hasn't produced things in a while because uh, he does some really neat stuff and is a very smart uh, person trying to figure out how to relate scientific principles to music and uh, modern culture. So I encourage you to look at that if you uh, want to want to spend a few minutes uh, watching a fun video. But it's an interesting thing that there is actually time implied by this quantity because it's constantly increasing, whereas most other quantities that we think about are conserved. Okay, that was an interlude. Now, well, let's go back to figuring out who has the highest entropy for reactions. Right? We were looking at products minus reactants and saying, oh, look, I've got a large entropy of my products, smaller entropy in my reactants, so my delta S is positive. But let's just look at a molecule. Let's just look at something all by itself just sitting there. And how do we determine entropy for that? Diamond or graphite? Okay, why diamond or graphite? Both of them are carbon. They're just big piles of carbon, but people call this one solid. People generally call this one GR for graphite. How could we tell the entropy of those two? Well, if we want to tell the entropy of something, right, we have to think about what are the numbers of ways of arranging things in that system. And if you know anything about diamond, you'll know that it's all tetrahedral carbon. We've got carbons here, we've got carbons there, and we've got carbons here, carbons there. And this guy also has carbons there and carbons there. And this big tetrahedral crystal arrangement where everything is very well ordered and bonded in all directions, all these things are tetrahedrals in the perfect diamond. And so it turns out that diamond has one of the smallest known entropies of large crystal molecules because it's so incredibly ordered. I'm gonna give you a number here, not gonna to make too much sense without context, but this is 2.4 joules per mole kelvin is the standard entropy. Now, you'll notice that I don't have a little f down here. When we look up things in a table, there's always that f there when we look up enthalpies. Because remember, we actually can't measure enthalpy directly. There's no way of saying this thing has an enthalpy of 5. We can actually only measure changes in enthalpy right because we have to look at something going in something going out and so we always in those textbooks in those tables that we have are always defining formation enthalpies which is how much energy does it take to make it from elements in its standard state so if we're making co2 we'd say c plus it's actually gr cgr plus o2 gas goes to co2 gas and that would be the reaction that we find the enthalpy for, and that's the enthalpy of formation of CO2. The enthalpy of formation of carbon graphite is this, because it's an element being made from its standard state, and so it's essentially zero, because right, you have the same thing on the right, same thing on the left, products minus reactants is zero. And so that's why our enthalpies of formation of things are zero when they are elements in their standard state, because that's how much energy it takes to create something from itself, is it takes no energy whatsoever. But things entropy is K ln W. K natural log of W, we can calculate that exactly, and we know it. And so when we say S in a table, we don't say S of formation, we don't say delta S of formation, we actually say here is the entropy of diamond, it can be calculated. Here is the entropy of graphite, it can be calculated. Now graphite is made up of these sheets. Well, so graphite pencils, right? When you write on them, these stuff comes off. Why? Because it's made up of these sheets that are very tightly bonded within the sheet, 
but are very loosely bonded across the sheets. And so there's a little bit of ability for them to move, to be sheared off onto a piece of paper. And so you'd expect that they're gonna have a higher entropy, right? Because there's more ways of arranging things that are not rigidly connected. They're only moderately connected, so they can move around a little bit. They can slide on each other and things like that. And so yes, we do get a higher entropy in this one for carbon graphite is 5.7 joules per mole Kelvin. Right? So almost double, or more than double, the entropy of diamond because there's just more ways of arranging the carbon atoms in graphite because there's these sheets that are well bonded, but between the sheets we do have some ability to rearrange things. And so we can look again always at the number of arrangements because that's how you calculate um, entropy to try to figure that out, but it does require a little bit of chemistry knowledge. How about if we're just looking at atoms? What if we're looking at argon atom versus, I would say atoms versus molecules. Argon atom versus nitrogen monoxide. I'm gonna give you a number here, this is 154.8. Again, we're just calculating S naught, and this is in units of joules per mole Kelvin. What do you think? Is NO gonna be bigger or smaller, right? Argon's a relatively large, um, uh, noble gas, right? It's on the third row of the periodic table. N and O are only a second row of the periodic table. They're smaller. Okay, so maybe they won't have as much. But when you look at the numbers, you get 210.8 joules per mole Kelvin on this one. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us, obviously, that NO has more entropy than argon just sitting there, which tells us it has more ways of distributing its energy Right, energetically equivalent microstates. It has more ways of distributing its energy. Why? Well, if we give argon some energy, what's it gonna do with it, right? It might bounce around. It might move its electrons from level to level or, or, or things like that. But that's about all it can do. Nitrogen monoxide can also bounce around. It can also move its electrons from level to level, but it can do other things too, right? Since I've got a uh, molecule here, let me grab one here. Yeah. Obviously, this is not nitrogen monoxide. It's just a molecule I happen to have on my floor that I took apart. But it's got two atoms here, right? So those two atoms, now if I wanted to give it some energy, right, I could make this guy rotate, right? I could make him flip around in the air. That's one way to use energy, right? It takes energy to start rotating, so that's another way to use energy. The other way that it can is you can't really see it in this kind of model kit, but right, this bond between them is more like a spring than it is a, thing, a fixed thing. And so these guys can actually go and bounce off each other kind of like a spring, move in, move out. We call that a vibration. So the nitrogen monoxide actually has several more ways of distributing energy than argon does by virtue of it being a molecule versus an atom. It can rotate, it can vibrate, and so we see that its uh, standard entropy is greater than that of argon. What about if we're comparing two molecules? Let's compare carbon monoxide and C2H4. If you look at C2H4, it looks like this. So let's compare those two, and then what are we going to see here? Well, carbon monoxide, a lot like nitrogen monoxide, we actually expect those to be awfully darn similar because they both have roughly the same size. They have the same number of atoms. They can both vibrate and rotate, and nitrogen and carbon are right next to each other on the periodic table, and that is what we find. Carbon <coughs> monoxide has an entropy of 197.7 joules per mole Kelvin. What do we think about C2H4? Right, can C2H4 do all the things that carbon monoxide can? Right? It can move around. It can rotate, right? That, even though it's a bigger molecule, it can sit there and rotate in space. It can also vibrate that CC bond. But what else can it do? Well, it can start to vibrate CH bonds. Right? Not only a CC bond, one bond, but CH bonds as well. And in fact, it can do coordinated vibrations. While well, this CH does this, this CH does this, and you get these, I can't even coordinate my, my fingers to do it. Right? You get these things coordinated. So that's great. It's got other ways of distributing its energy. Also, what it can do is as soon as I've got these, you know, I'm, I'm the carbon, my hydrogen is sticking up here. As soon as I've got that, it turns out I can do these kind of things here. I can do bends and stuff. I can do torsions. That's other ways of using my energy. And if I got all these energetically equivalent ways, 
microstates that are available to me, I'm going to have a larger W, which means I'm going to have a larger S. And we see that reflected in here. This is 219.3 joules per mole Kelvin. Now you do get funny exceptions here and there with molecules that are very constrained, like benzene is going to have a smaller um, entropy than you expect because it's this ring structure, so it's kind of constrained in what it can do. But this is a general way of being able to predict it. First thing you're going to look at is, um, well, what you're always going to look at is the number of ways of arranging. How can I arrange energy in this one? If I've got an atom, it's relatively small. I can bounce it around. I can move electrons. But the bigger the molecule gets, the more ways I have arranging. So generally, bigger molecules have higher entropy than smaller molecules. Although, like I said, there are exceptions for molecules that are constrained in how they exist. And then molecules are almost always going to beat atoms in terms of their entropy. And if we're looking at two very similar systems, what we do really have to look at is structure. Is there ways of moving things? So we had the diamond versus the graphite. Is there ways of moving things around in one that there's not in the other? always comes back to s equals k times the natural log of w. What are the number of ways of arranging my system and distributing energy in it? So which of the following molecules would have the highest molar entropy? Molar entropy is just a term to say, hey, my units are joules per mole Kelvin. OK, so which of the units would have highest molar entropy? What did you come up with? Well, we said, hey, look, if I'm comparing molecules, molecular complexity is going to be one of my biggest contributors here. So if I look at molecular complexity, this guy's just got the most atoms. He's got six atoms versus the other guys have two atoms, three atoms, four atoms. And so I'm just going to make a guess. The thing with six atoms has the highest molar entropy. And guess what? I would be right. So if I tried to predict that just based on molecular size, I would be right, and my S204 would have my largest thing because there's more ways. All of those can vibrate, but right, he's got a lot more ways to vibrate, a lot more bonds that can vibrate, a lot more bonds that can do little wiggles and waggles and torsions and things like that, so it can um, distribute energy. And this last question for today, in which reaction is the entropy change like to be positive? So you're going to look at those four different reactions there and try to tell me which of those reactions is likely to have a positive entropy change. Well, let's see. Gas to liquid. Liquids, not much entropy. Gas, a ton of entropy. Little s, minus big S, no. Okay, gases, 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 liquid, all right? So I'm not going to look at the liquid. I don't care about it for entropy changes. So I've got one gas on the right. I've got three gases on the left. One minus three, that's a negative. That's a negative entropy change. I don't think so. Iron, solid, gas. Okay, so I don't look at the solids because I've got a gas. I'm just going to look at the gas. I've got no gas on the right. Minus three gas, that's going to be negative as well. This last one better work because otherwise I'm in trouble, right? That's what happens sometimes. You right, go through this multiple choice and you cross, cross out all of them. You're like, ah! Okay. But this last one better work. What do I have? Well, everybody's a gas in this one, so I can just add up. On the left, I've got 11 gases. And on the right, I've got 6, 10, 12 gases. The number of gases is always going to win. Adding an extra molecule is always going to win over complexity of molecules. And so 11 gases, 12 gases, I don't even have to look at the complexity of the molecules. I can say for pretty darn good certain that this is going to have a positive entropy change. And so my answer would be D. All right, thanks so much for listening. Have a wonderful day.